our uh, next uh, uh, presentation is uh, topic is uh, uh, MIPI uh, CSI2 application for vision and sensor fusion systems. And the presenter is uh, uh, Richard Saprao uh, from Cadence Design System. Uh, Richard Saprao is an uh, is the IP architect, architect for Cadence Design Systems, responsible for MIPI visual products. Richard has worked with Cadence for the last four years and previously worked with Nokia and ST Mac Electronics on application, baseband and RF processors, SOC design and architecture. Richard has 26 years in electronics field and holds a Master's in Applied Microelectronics and BSc in Electronics from Glasgow University. Please welcome Richard. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, okay uh, hi everyone. Um, as you can tell, I'm not from around here, so uh, let me know if I'm, you're not being exactly clear to everybody. Um, what I'm here to do is present more uh, information on the, the camera application side. I'm not here to do any sales pitches, which you'll be glad to know, even though my marketing guys are quite unhappy about that. Uh, but what I want to try and introduce is some of the good points and not so good points about the camera um, CSI2 application uh, in various sort of scenarios. So, what I've been looking at is uh, really how the, the, the imaging world has been changing from uh, sort of the vision based side uh, using CSI and application processors and seeing how that can actually be extended as part of the MIPI protocol into different applications. Uh, in IoT space uh, or uh, automotive uh, and any other space which you can actually think of to create a product which needs a camera in it. Um, what I want to go through really is uh, some of the, the requirements of, on your system side uh, and what you're actually trying to uh, pull together uh, in order to make sure that how you transmit your data from uh, your camera sensor or your sensor cluster back to your application makes sense. Okay, so as you've probably been told in many uh, presentations so far today, camera applications are used everywhere. So essentially the, the market started with the mobile phones, sticking it in there with a single camera. It's been in technology uh, and, and applications for many, many years. People have kind of tried to adapt that, adding more cameras, stick it on the front, stick it on the back, two cameras on the front. Various things you can do, it's all good news for those people who want to take a picture, a picture and make sure that they're on Facebook, Facebook whatever the application is. Video games, uh, I've started to see more and more use where you're actually detecting the, 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 the game player actually in uh, the 3D space, help integrate them into the gameplay, um, dance around, do various things. Autonomous driving uh, and uh, real world applications where you're actually trying to use the visual world to help identify uh, the space around your vehicle and make sure that uh, you might not be aware of it as a driver, but you make sure that the car helps you understand that you've, you're going to hit something, you're going to miss something, you're driving too fast, or essentially to help you do things in a car that you wouldn't normally want to try and do. Uh, my wife's favorite one is obviously parallel parking. She's terrible at it, so the sooner you guys get out there and actually create an application where her car will park exactly where she wants to be, the better. Uh, one of the other things is the in-car control. There's potentially going to be more and more use cases where you're actually going to have a camera inside your car to help you do some sort of gesture recognition or detection. Uh, when you're sitting having to find the buttons on your radio system, well, why not just wave your hand and let your car figure it out for you? One of the important things about uh, camera applications is it's not what we see, it's what the camera sees. So 
all your applications are going to have to take into account that machine vision is much better than anything that we're actually going to do. So we're going to have a lot more information supplied to our system uh, in bytes and bits of information. And also the sensors can work completely differently, helping us find more information in that 3D space in front of us, behind us, above us, below us. So getting your application to think about how all of these sensors are going to be gathering information and pulling them into your system helps you figure out what you want to do. So it's more than the naked eye when you're actually in the machine vision world. So taking things out of the visual space into the infrared, helping you understand what you need to do from making your application work in the day and in the night. CSI has always been based around simple camera sensor with a little I2C interface, which goes and connects to all the other little the sensor devices around your camera. So your, your lens control, your flash control, light sensors, all of that sits there on this little bus. And the camera work group have worked on improving how that control actually works. So when you've actually got more and more sensors actually being built into your camera sensor in the front, gyros and stuff like that, then you need to help standardize that and make it easy for the application to go away and control all of that while still supporting all the things you need to do on your camera. One of the things about the CSI spec is it comes with a companion document with a CCI where you're actually doing a definition of the camera control interface that helps you set the, how the registers work inside your sensor so that no matter whose sensor you go out and pick, there's some sort of generic way of controlling all of these things. And then you can get all the secret sauce, which is hidden from most customers by talking to your supplier. Camera control interface helps you do uh, all your um, application control, um, helps keep that um, your application side so that you can control how the system comes up and down, enables, disables the camera sensor, and also if you want to potentially use some of your other sensors in different ways. Uh, what I've got in the diagram is I2C. But clearly, I3C is going to be the way forward, at least for over very, very short distances. What's one of the things which the camera work groups hope to actually improve is that a lot of the camera applications which we see from the, the ven uh, sensor vendor side uh, really need more and more uh, devices to be grouped in clusters, whether it be sensor clusters, imaging clusters, there's going to be more things grouped together and they want to be controlled in a very uh, simple manner, either as a group or as uh, individual devices. But essentially, we want the spec to evolve to the point where we can improve all of that working as part of a system. I know you've probably had lots of presentations explaining the bandwidth thing, but it's always about the number of pins you want to do, whether you need legacy support. Clearly, most of the markets exist for DeFi, but if you decide that you don't want to support that and you're looking for the future, you go for CeFi, do you have a combo? All of that stuff's for you guys to decide when it comes to the system, but it's always how many pins, what's the bandwidth you want to hit? So figure out whether you want to actually stick with a, a DeFi interface, which case you have, you've got to compromise with the number of lanes that you're going to have and the data rates that's going to support, or whether you commit to going for a CeFi application where you're going to get a higher bandwidth if you're looking for the very high end uh, and with a reduced number of pins. What that actually means from the CSI point of view is that the specs evolved and try to get as much as we can out of the DeFi. So our first generation, um, the uh, CSI 1.1, 1, 1 .1, we had one and a half gigabits. So we were quite happy with that. And that lasted a reasonable amount of time. And then everybody went, no, I want two cameras. I want bigger cameras. I want more sensors. I want more megabits per pixel. So we came back and we said, right, we'll have a slightly improved version. So we up the, the rate, and we increase the number of data lanes that we can support. So great, we've increased the bandwidth, and off we went. And then we also introduced CFI. Don't know why. 
but gives you a choice. Again, you've got to choose between this one or this one, or both if you want a combo, but it gave you what you wanted. Faster rates, more ba bandwidth, it's all looking good. People wanted more. So off we go again, we've upped the speeds. CFI up to four and a half gigs, some uh, symbols per second. DeFi, four and a half gigs. More pins, more configurations. All of this stuff's good news if you want to keep filling that channel with more and more bandwidth. It looks good in the slide. It's always up and to the right. Great, uh, but at some point we're going to lose interest in what, what we're actually going to do with the camera sensor. So what are we going to do with 40 megapixel pictures of my face? I don't know. But what that actually means is we've got a lot of bandwidth. What are we going to do with the bandwidth? We're going to fill it up with other interesting things. So we've got a lot of bandwidth there with our tiny camera sensor, even if it's in 4K. We can fill up the rest of the bandwidth around it with other things. So let's fill it up with other sensors. We've got a whole lot of other things which we want to go away and plug in and we've used that bandwidth to transfer stuff back to our application. So we've got other sensor devices which we're going to connect in our system, most likely in an ADIS application because everybody's doing ADIS. So what's happened with the spec itself is we started off down here and we were quite happy. And then we went a little bit better. And then we went a lot better. And now what we're looking for in the new version of CSI spec is lots. We want lots of bandwidth, we want lots of megapixels. We want to just fill that sucker up with images. So, Keep flicking the switches, keep turning up the power, keep increasing the number of data lanes. But what we're going to do is we're going to fill it up with something a bit more interesting than this picture does. What this is actually meaning to the CSI spec is previously our wonderful spec had lots of little packets. Our little bytes got transmitted from one end to the other, but we had to have this transition back into a low power state. That's bad news because basically the CFI and, and DFIs have to spend a lot of time going back to low power and then powering up again because we want to transmit in high speed. That's what we want to do and we want to keep that going for as long as we can. If we want to save power, we just go and do something different. But more power is what we want. We're going to fill that up and what we're going to do in CSI V2 is we're going to replace the LP state by little fillers so we can remain in high speed and just keep pushing the data through. What does that actually mean? It's all good news. We're ramping up. We've increased the actual bandwidth that we're going to get, even though the bitrate hasn't actually changed. So we're, we're getting 20, 25, 30% improvement just by getting rid of the LP state. It's all good news. Like all designers, we want to keep ramping it up to 11 so that we actually go out there, push our system to the limit, and actually make it fall over for some other reason. Automotive, it's great. Marketing slides always tell you exactly what you need to do. You can go and turn that into an engineering spec anytime you want. But what it actually means is we've got to figure out how we're actually going to get all of this external system information into our application. So we've got a lot of stuff happening outside in the visual world. We've got objects, we've got things moving around, we've got to decide what resolution is actually good enough for us to get information to make decisions. We've got night vision. What, how are we going to get the dynamic range out of what we're actually doing? So you guys can go away and figure that out. I already know, but there you go. People detection, <laughs> deciding whether the information that's coming in can be analyzed quick enough to determine that somebody's walked into the front of your car or some truck trailer has passed in front of your view. Do something about it. Do you actually care about whether you need all the resolution? Do you want to actually work in the visual world. Road signage, everybody's doing some sort of recognition system, but how much resolution do you need to actually figure out that you're parked next to a 30 zone? Parking assistance, again, somebody get it fixed so my wife can stop nagging me. It's the thing where you're actually using all your sensors in your vehicle to figure out where it is in space and where it needs to go. 
So the ideal would be that we do away with the valley parking. You just rock up to wherever you want to be, press your button, it will go off and find the empty space wherever it is in the car park. That's what I want. In-car gesture control. I think there's going to be a lot of people doing this stuff because seeing what's happening inside your car is quite useful. Because figuring out that somebody is busy seeing karaoke and not actually paying attention to the road in front of them would be a good thing for any ADA system to figure out that it needs to do something a little bit different. Stop you, hit, put the brakes on, tell you to get out of the car and stop it. How's this looking a system? It's great. IP companies love this because you're going to pick a lot of stuff to stick in there just to get it to power up and go, Bing. hello world. Well, what I'm interested in is the bit down here. It's cameras. It's DeFi interfaces. We want as many cameras and sensors in there as we can, but there's too many pins. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink it. The best way to shrink it is to combine all the data. And I've just had a presentation tell you how to aggregate everything. It's all good news. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our sensors. There's loads of different ways of actually putting this information together. You've got long range radar, you've got ultrasonic, you've got visual world, you've got interior sensors. All this stuff you can combine, aggregate in some way into your conduit to transmit to your application. What you've got to decide is how do you actually do that on your conduit? It doesn't have to be DeFi. But could be. It doesn't have to be C5. Could be. Could be any of that. But what you've got to decide is how you're going to get the best out of your bandwidth. So, do you just pull all of the sensor data down into your application and let it figure it out? I don't necessarily think that's a good idea. I think you're going to be much more interested in taking some of the information data that you've actually got, figuring out how each of these sensors work, and deciding what information you need to pass down. Your application is going to spend a lot of time chugging away, doing not very much of use for your system. So figure out where you actually want to be. LiDAR detectors don't run at the same rate. They're a completely different type of setup. You're going to get some sort of raw data based on the sensor that's kicking back. It's going to be maybe 64 pixels high if it really wants to be. But it's going to be narrow, long, slow. That's going to have to fit into your stream of data. So when you aggregate it, do, do you care that you have to try and match this frame rate from your camera sensor? I don't think so. It doesn't have to, because the CSI spec allows you to go away and create interleaved data however you want. It doesn't have to be the same frame rate. Don't care, because the other end figures it out. You send synchronization events to help your system understand what's happening at this side matches what's happening at this side. So don't worry about it as quite as much as some people might say. Radar, you're going to have a lot of stuff going on there because people rely on it. You want to be looking far in the distance and figuring out where you're going, especially when you start to get into the high speeds. You're going to have to be looking further and further ahead, figuring out whether you actually need to do something and whether something is actually changing in front of you. Ultrasonic, you're getting into the short range stuff, help me park. Again, come on guys, self-parking, sort it out. So the way the protocol is actually working is rather than looking at the visual world where you've got raw data types, YUV data types, RGB data types, there's a whole lot of extra things inside the CSI protocol which allow you to stick generic data in there. And you can tag it with any number you want based on what the protocol allows you, but you can give your own data type a unique number and your system can extract that at the other end, figure out where it has to go inside your system, route it to the right place so that the DSP that's going to analyze that data gets to exactly what it needs to do. Pretty picture. CSI V1, four lanes, six gigabits. We're going to fill it up. We're going to fill it up with free HD camera, RGB 888. What's the gaps? Let's fill the gaps. Let's make it do something a bit more useful. So on this pretty diagram, what I've done is I've pre-processed all this. I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to send my three images. I've got three frame starts. I've got three frame ends. Three frames have happened. I'm also going to send a little bit of data, generic data, 
my little application at the front has taken all my sensors, it's done a little bit of pre-processing and I've got some embedded data which my system is going to use to figure out whether it needs to do anything with these frames. So a whole lot of things you can do that spec allows you to go away and do, just decide how you want to you make your system actually work for you a little bit more. What this might actually look like, I'm going to merge some data from a couple of sensors. So I've got two cameras, I've got two little onboard sensors for doing ultrasonic. Merge them into a little device. I'm going to do a little bit of front-end processing, a little video buffer. Do you care whether you got to buffer a line? Well, you've got enough time to buffer a line and push it out without impacting on anything else that's happening around here. It's all fine. Don't worry about it too much. You've got a system architect, you're going to figure out what bandwidth you need to actually make happen on this physical interface in order to achieve everything here without actually overflowing or underflowing or causing anything catastrophic to happen to your CSI packets. Your application on the other end is going to just see lovely little set of packets coming through and it's going to receive them and put them in the right place, whether it's going to a frame buffer for image processing or whether it's going into an ISP pipeline or whether it's going to go into some other DSP application. Video processor at this front end, you can decide whether you just pass the data through. You've got a little bit of time if you've got some sort of um, CSI sensor or you've got CMOS sensor, a little bit of control whether you need to actually extend that into a frame buffer. It's, it's up to you. There's system things which you guys have to decide which aren't going to be like an off-the-shelf generic solution. Once you decide how you're actually going to do that, it's easy enough to make a decision because the numbers will always match up. You ban within, you ban without. Once your application guys decide what they want to stick in that side, kind of defines exactly how you handle all the information coming in on the front. My recommendation is always to think about pre-processing some of the data that you're actually getting from your sensors in the front and before you actually commit anything down a CSI link to a system. Image processing as a whole raft of things you can actually go off and do. It's pretty important because when you actually start to chug away and do some analysis on your frame, if you've got uh, nothing actually happening, then that's a whole wasted effort in your system. So if you look at how your architecture is going to work and you figure out how your algorithm is going to work on your application, decide where it best fits, where you're interested in actually getting the data, whether it's raw from a camera sensor, you're then going to have to pre-process that in order to turn it into color information or do some other analysis up front. Decide whether you want to do that on the application side or whether you want to push it back up the stream a little bit so that you've actually got less effort on the application. Some of the um, things that you might want to do when you actually get into the system, the object detection and the feature extraction, if you've done some of this pre-processing, uh, you've got a lot of information by actually just doing this in line. So decide whether some of this object detection could actually be done by gathering some information or uh, some analysis in this section. Once you've actually got something that's actually useful for the system to know, you've got the opportunity to send some embedded data, some generic data back down into your system so that it knows when it gets this frame of information from a visual uh, sensor or some other sensor that it should go away and do something about it because there's nothing in the frame or there's something in the frame which could be of interest. One of the other things you should consider is it's the camera applications and CSI in particular is unidirectional. It's a point to point. Camera sensors detect, push it into your system, and that's it. But what you can do is DeFi allows you to do a lot of things if you've got bidirectional lanes. Bidirectional doesn't work for CSI. We're not interested in it. It's, it's just not fun. But 
what if you actually want to send a whole load of information from your application site back up to your sensor cluster? How am I going to best do that? Well, I3C, really? I don't think so. Why not just stick another data lane in there? You've already created all of these and you've rescued some pins because you've optimized your system correctly. So we may as well throw those pins back in because nobody will notice a difference. So we've now got a link coming back the other way, but hang on, it's DeFi. Why haven't we got a clock? Well, we have got a clock. So the whole DeFi spec allows you to do bidirectional by using the quarter rate clock coming back. Well, it doesn't say that it has to be the same lane. It can be completely standalone lane. So we'll, re we'll reuse that. So we'll take our clock that we're recovering here and we'll use that to transmit back at a quarter rate. So we've now got a couple of hundred megs of bandwidth coming back which we can use to transfer data back and forward. We can send stuff back up to our sensor control block. We can do a whole lot of extra things that our system never used to be able to do. All sounds like good news until we reach the physical interface. Met me and DeFi and it's fine. It's, it's, it's all aimed at wearables and mobile and all that. So we're, we're quite happy that it works in the mobile space. Once we start to get into automotive space and other applications, it's not quite as friendly because how do we get our bandwidth out of those long cables? So one of the primary objectives of uh, the MIPI groups, D5 and Camera Work Group, is looking at better ways of actually transporting, transporting our information across longer links so watch this space. There are lots of spaces for us to fill, but we're going to go through all of this stuff and I helpfully identify some of the real world applications where we need to use CSI and get something out of it, but at reasonable rates. Most of the stuff that we're looking at at the moment is in the automotive segment. Some of the numbers are pretty low, but you can still do things with it, but not what we want to do, which is fill our bandwidth with sensors from all sorts of imaging clusters and LiDAR and radar and other any other device which we want to stick in there. There's a few little notes on the side, so when you get the slides, you can get, get some free time and go away and read that, but essentially, we're wanting to do away with the low power state because that's eating up our bandwidth, and we would like to fill that up with other nonsense. One of the other issues when you start to go into the world of safety on ADIS is how do you keep track of everything that's going on? CSI spec allows you to put numbers into all the synchronization events. So you can track what's going on with Frame starts for every single packet you're, um, frame that you're sending, frame ends, but you can also send line starts and line ends. Line starts and line ends go with every single payload that you send. And with these line starts and line ends and frame starts, frame ends, you can give them unique numbers and they'll increment as they go through. One of the pitfalls of the spec is that it's increments base, well, the, this line start event happens before the payload, so how do you keep track of it? How do you figure out that this line start for this virtual channel and data type is going to be associated with this payload? It becomes more of an issue when problems start. So functional safety, it's, it's a big thing at the moment where all the IP guys are out desperately trying to make their IP safe to the world as far as they're concerned so they can sell it. From the spec point of view, there's a whole lot of things built in which we like. D5 bit error rate, the RX error, uh, sync detection, error detection, all of that stuff happens in the D5 when something catch traffic happens physically. We get a few error signals that come from the D5, but how does your system know what that means? So th there's a few things which you're going to have to figure out from a system point of view because the CSI spec doesn't care. It's just expecting data, happy data. Inside our CSI spec, we've got packet headers. So our packet header for every single packet is some information about our virtual channel, the data type, the word count, the number of bytes we're expected to send with that payload, 
and also an ECC to say that, okay, check all that information I've just sent you. Is it good? Yes. In our payload, we track CRC through it and we send you the last two bytes as a CRC. Is that happy? It's all good news? Yep. Short packet sequences, counting, all of this stuff helps you once you've enabled it. What it doesn't do is help you when it doesn't work. So if you get a calculated ECC, that means you've got more than two bit errors in your header. So what do you do with your header? Was my header a payload? Was it a synchronization event? Which virtual channel was it for? Which data type was it for? If you've got a system where you've interleaved all of this stuff and aggregated it into something, how does your system figure out what it needs to do next? You get a CRC error. Does, does it actually make a difference? So if you've got a stream of data and it's an image, uh, a line of, uh, from an image, do you care that one bit inside that has actually transposed and it's gone slightly redder than you expected? Does that make a difference to your system? You have to decide. We can flag that and then let you figure out what you need to do with it. What happens if you miss synchronization events? What happens if you get multiple synchronization events back to back and because of errors, you detect something completely different? All of these things, CSI spec, ah, well, that's your problem. We'll tell you how that these events might happen, but you've got to figure out how your system reacts to that. So there's a whole lot of what ifs. Pitfalls of interleaving, this is my favorite one at the moment because a spec allows you to go away and stick a line start event associated with every single payload. So here we've got a packet which has got no line start. Good news. A packet, it's virtual channel zero, it's line start one, because it's counting line one of this type. Ah, but here we've got virtual channel zero, line start one for this payload. So anytime that you start to lose synchronization events, you're going to quickly end up in a little mess if you're relying on that to figure out how your system is reacting. That's what it looks like if you start to go to the spec. This is what it allows. All sorts of different combinations and scenarios where you can actually fill up two frames of data with visual information with line starts enabled, visual information without line starts. It's it's going to be fun if that falls over in a little heap and your system doesn't know how to get out of it in a safe manner. Okay. Having created all sorts of nonsense, we want to go away and actually keep driving it forward. So we're going to start looking at how we improve all of this into real world applications outside mobile. So today, all these ADIS applications and sensor fusion is looking at how we actually do very simple operations. So our, our earlier generation of CSI has helped us get this far. That's about it. So what we're gonna have to do is improve some of the information that we actually get to help you guys go off and design a system which is gonna be a lot safer to use. So we're gonna look at how the spec can help you do that because the goal is always to reach this, where the vehicle drives itself and you can sit and watch your video and take Snapchat and do whatever you want to do in your car while it sorts out where you have to go and does it safely. And of course, ideally, it wants to be working by then so that my wife can have her car park it. What it's doing, if you're doing CNN applications, it's a great buzzword, but nobody's actually come up with something really useful as far as I'm concerned, figuring out how you use all the information coming in from your sensors in your network to go away and actually decide that it can go away and assist you, it can take charge of your vehicle, or it can completely go off and do its own thing, ideally go to work and pick you up in the evening. Some of the things you have to decide uh, when you're actually doing some of the processing of stuff, um, you've got all this information, do you keep pulling it together in, in one area? That's a lot of stuff to decide whether it's meaningful for your system to make decisions. Um, you've then got an application layer on top of that which is going to go off and actually decide how to control your vehicle. So all of that stuff is a system level nightmare. 
accelerating a lot of that is going to rely on how you actually want to take your sensor data uh, and actually decide whether you're actually going to implement this in a configurable manner in an FPGA where you can go back and rewrite it once your car's crashed a half dozen times or whether you actually just stick it into an SOC and just use accelerators and rely on the fact that your software will get around it. Kind of key risks and uncertainties are, well, like, like all things, will the market accept it? Can you get to production quick enough? And really, after a few more disasters, will the regulator step in and stop you anyway? Beyond the mobile, it's clearly what MIPI want to drive us forward, doing something a little bit more different with our spec. Um, so what we can do is use all we know, what we've gathered so far, just by using it in real applications for uh, mobile, the photography and the vision. There's, there's a lot of good stuff out there already for doing image processing and working on how to use sensors in a three-dimensional space. So maybe getting uh, some of the MIPI specs to understand that the CSI spec is not going to be just for cameras in the future, it's going to extend into other uh, sensor devices. Perception and decision making is really going to influence how you actually use that, whether you're going to be happy with how the CSI spec works um, is, is a system issue. I think uh, a lot, of the, a lot of the applications that you can do nowadays can easily fit into an environment using CSI spec. It's not used its full potential, uh, mainly because it, 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 all it had to do was connect a couple of cameras inside a mobile device. But I've used it for some applications where you, you, you've, you, you can push the spec to the limit and it's quite happy. So obviously we can stretch it a little bit further until it's unhappy and then rewrite the spec. Uh, <laughs> One of the key things from any system point of view is how your performance and your robustness works. Um, deciding how your camera works, your lighting control and the environmental factors are, are clearly going to influence exactly how your system um, works in the end. So when you're creating your system of any sort, whether it be ADIS or whether it be um, like Dyson sticking a couple of cameras into uh, a room, the Hoover uh, product that he's got, um, which makes no sense to me at all, but good for him. Uh, it, it's up to you how you get the best out of your bandwidth. You're, you're going to have a whole lot of physical decisions to make C5 and D5, but at the end of the day, use that bandwidth wisely uh, and just keep filling it up. Um, if you want to learn more, I'm around. Uh, there's also some interesting um, stuff in some of the exhibits. So uh, yeah, with that said, is there any questions? Any questions for Richard? I have a quick one. Um, it's interesting that regardless of application for where the standards are looking for, how can I create a faster pipe? Maybe I can throw more sensor data in it. Uh, along those lines, any thought about putting any sort of compression in the front end? Uh, just like, like the display guys are thinking, put some <laughs> compression, create more capacity? Yeah, I think in, in the camera world, um, as soon as you start to do compression, then you're going to inject errors. And the one thing about a lot of these applications is you wanted to use raw data uh, so that you, you process with, with exactly what your sensor has picked up. So. One of the things about having um, your, your architecture decision is whether you're, you're going to let your camera sensor or your sensor cluster send you the raw data so that you then have that to process or whether you actually care about pre-processing it and, then, and, and reducing the number of physical pins because you don't have to have the excess bandwidth to do that. Any other question? We do have some time for a couple of questions. Okay, thank you for your attention. There is coffee going to be served. Yeah, thank you. Give a big hand. Thanks.